Okay. Yes. Well, thanks for coming. Um, I wanted to talk about some, some work I've been doing over the last year or two, uh, looking at the sort of student life in the late 19th century in Mass Aggie. The first 50 years is really w my focus. And I became very interested in, in the question of when the first African-American student arrived at UMass, when the first international students, when people of color arrived on campus at UMass. And I was a little bit surprised by some of the findings. It wasn't obvious to me that Mass Aggie would have been a pioneer in anything along those lines. But there are a couple of moments in which we do have pioneering moments, where we have these little events that happen in you. Yes, I think say a lot about larger culture, a lot about the role of Massachusetts in the country, a lot about the agricultural college and its role in the state. And so I just wanted to walk through a little bit and think about what it was like at Mass Aggie in the 19th century, because you, you sit up here on the 20th floor and you look 360 degrees from the center of campus and you look around and you think, this place is actually kind of busy now. They seem to be building on every little free scrap of land. There are new construction east and west of here, south of here, not so much north of here, but even with the West Engineering Station north of here. And they're gradually erasing a lot of the history of this campus. Uh, I think that erasure began intentionally in the 1950s. I've talked about this before, when the university made its final gasp to try to break free from its agricultural heritage. And I think symbolically, uh, the couple of things took place in the 1950s. One was selling off our horse, our, our herd of horses. Uh, the uh, Pertrans and the Morgans that had been the mainstay of the agricultural campus here for, for, for decades. They sold them off, used the money to uh, fund educational programs, fund undergraduate educational programs. Nothing wrong with that, but it was a deliberate turn away from thinking about us as an agricultural place. I think more important than that are these concrete monstrosity buildings that we have around here that some people actually seem to like. I'm not one of those some. But some people seem to like them, but they're not so much that they're just ugly buildings or bad buildings, but they're buildings that are conscious refutation of agricultural heritage. You come here in the middle of this beautiful landscape that we have, one of the most beautiful landscapes in the country. It's a beautiful bucolic place, and they, they plop in these buildings that are full concrete, urban buildings in the middle here. And it was part of this conscious decision to say that we're a modern college, which meant to the people who were in the administration at the time, that we could not be an agricultural college. So I'll start with that and take a look back a little bit. And you know, if you'd been here, essentially not quite literally here, but about 30 yards that way or 40 yards that way, in around 1900, this is what you would have seen. You would have looked up Old Chapel here on the, le on the right, uh, South College on the left. This photograph is says around 1900, and you can see this beautiful path. The pond isn't visible, but it's right down here on the right. Trees everywhere, well landscaped. It's a real agricultural college. And this was the heart of both the social campus at the time, where the students lived. They lived in South College. They lived in North College, which you can sort of see there. Uh, many of them lived in fraternities which were also around and some boarded in town. But this was the heart of campus. Um, the pond uh, wasn't always crowded with people, but uh, sometimes did get crowded with people. The rope pole, uh, this is a little bit later, maybe 19, uh, 1910 or so. And you can see uh, the beauty of the campus here. We were an agricultural ca campus and we lived agriculture. Many of the trees that you see here much of the work that was done here to landscape this, to build this campus, was done by students in the early years. Built on plans done by you know, great architects, uh, but this campus was built up uh, over a matter of, of years. But what was it like to be a student here? Uh, I often like to say it, it was cold and forbidding. That was always my assumption. Um, and it, this is Mass State College, uh, or sorry, Mass Agricultural College. A uh, photograph of one of the buildings in, in uh, the middle of summer. It was a lot colder back in the day. Global warming has changed everything. 
But campus was much more intimate than it is now. The classes in the late 19th century ranged anywhere from as low as 10 people, but usually 25 at the bottom, up to 75 or 100. So your cohort was small. And I, I was just looking at some student surveys that were done in 1910 and then again in 1920, and they asked the students and the alums what their impression of campus is and what they really cared about on campus, what they found most positive here. In 1915, the students, one after another after another, cited that they love the democratic atmosphere here. They said, we come in, it's a small class, it's a small school, so that when you're a freshman and you come in, by the end of the year, you know everyone around you. You know the seniors, you know the juniors, the sophomores. You certainly know everyone you come in with. Very intimate, very close. At the time, up until the 1890s, and I'll talk about this, every student took exactly the same progression of courses for quite a number of years, up until around 1900, 1895, 1900. So students had a lot of class time together, and they socialized together because they lived in these dorms. And as a small group of students, you're with one another night and day throughout the year, working in the fields, working in the classroom, living in the same rooms, sharing virtually everything. One place to eat on campus, just a couple of dorms, a few little things here that made this a very intimate experience, and students loved it. And that democratic ideal was something that was baked into the college early on, that we were a college for the people, the sons of toil. We were here for the average person in the state, not the people who would go to the Harvards or the Yales, who would want to do that anyway, but you wouldn't do that to come to UMass. This is a place you could come to be educated in practical arts, to learn real things, and it carried into the student body to say that even though there were rivalries between sophomores and juniors, between classes, rivalries to some degree between uh, football players and baseball players perhaps, and I'll come back to that in a minute, even though there were these little rivalries typical of any college at the time, it was a college in which every student felt they were part of the scene and every student felt committed to the whole. So I had thought that Mass Aggie would be an all-white school, and that was my assumption. It's an agricultural college in a largely white state, predominantly a white state, uh, at a time when people of color were not able to go to college very often in the United States. Very few went to college. But Mass Aggie has this history of having international students come in. It's a distinctive history, a different one than you would see at a Harvard or Yale or uh, most other elite colleges of the day. Our first international student is probably not Saitaro Naito, but uh, a Brazilian student who came in about the same time. Saitaro Naito came in 1872, which is just about the time uh, Ma Mass Aggie uh, first graduated in class was 1871. So this is really right at the beginning of the college. We have a, an international student coming here from Japan. And we had this quite famous here at, at Mass Aggie, this strong relationship with Japan that began when the imperial government in Japan was looking to modernize looking to take Japanese institutions and bring them into the 19th century and advance their cause by taking the best of Western science and applying it to Japanese culture, to bring it in. So they reached out to William Smith Clark, who was the, effectively the first president of UMass, not a Mass Aggie, not technically the first, but effectively the first. And we began a series of exchanges that brought Japanese students here over quite a number of years. Um, Shiro Kuroda came in eight, his class of 1895. He did graduate, went back to Japan. I use this photo only because it shows him in his military uniform. And you, you probably are aware that Mass Aggie is a land-grant college, had a requirement for military training. You had to go as a student here, as an undergraduate student, you went through military training. This applied to the foreign students, the international students as well. Japanese students came here predominantly to learn agriculture to bring it back, to learn modern techniques in agriculture and bring it back to Japan, but also to learn military science. Um, Bunzo Hashiguchi is, is one of the most famous of uh, the early grads from, from Japan. He graduated in 1881, as you can see here. 
he went off and became uh, almost immediately the president of the sugar beet company in Japan. Sugar beets were viewed as a progressive source of sugar. They had been raised here uh, in, the, in um, uh, this region pretty uh, inefficiently and poorly back in the 1840s and 50s as an alternative to cane sugar, as a slave-free alternative to cane sugar. But that association of sugar beets uh, and progressive agriculture hung on for a number of years after that political uh, imperative of growing sugar through beets instead of cane passed. But Bunzo Hashiguchi took this knowledge of sugar beets that he, he raised here, took it back to Japan, and became president of their national sugar beet company. He also later became a governor of Formosa, apparently. Um, I have this picture here, the Japanese students you can see in the crowd here in a summer course in 1920. So this connection with Japan is very long. But what's interesting here is it's not just Japan. Second to Japan, or maybe first, depending on the exact period of time, is we had this tremendous influx of Brazilian students. So Manuel Diaz Carnero in 1878, special course, SE is special course, came here. But there was a whole series of Brazilian students who come here. The Almeida brothers, two of the three, uh, graduated from Mass Aggie. We, all, we had students like George Mansour, also uh, international students from, uh, in his case, Turkey. And there was, after Brazil and Japan, Turkey is our third supplier of foreign students. I looked in vain for any European students here in the 19th century. And thus far, I haven't found any, not one. We had students from Cuba, Chile, from Costa Rica, uh, several from Mexico. But the big three, Japan, Turkey, and Brazil. And that's very unusual. You think you have English speakers coming in here, or you think you have people from Western European countries coming here to study. This is an agricultural college devoted to this, and we're drawing instead from countries that we don't normally think of as supplying a, a large number of students to a foreign, uh, foreign country. Jose Arrero is uh, one of the Cuban students here, by the way. So this comes to um, one of the guys who's rapidly becoming one of my favorite, favorite people, the, the man that planned the facial hair. This is Henry Hill Goodell, after whom Goodell Library is named. And Goodell became president of Mass Ag in 1885. He was 1880, 1884 to 1905, pardon me. And Goodell is one of the guys who is not well recognized today for what he did. But I think Goodell probably revolutionized this college as much as anybody has. And I, I've become more and more convinced that I'm right on this one. So please don't argue with me. Just don't. It makes for an ugly talk if, if I do. But, but Goodell arrived here. He was a Civil War veteran. He had served in the 25th Connecticut Infantry down in Louisiana during the war, a nine-month regiment. He was an officer in there. Uh, again, I'll probably have a reason to come back to that. But Goodell you know, arrived in 1885 at a point in which Mass Aggie was at quite a low ebb. Finances were terrible. There was a real likelihood that we might shut down. But right after Goodell came in, he began doing things that stabilized finances. He began doing things like developing the extension, well, first the experiment station, and then later the extension service, which made us much more useful to the Commonwealth. We were doing real research on agriculture that we were spreading to people in the state. And the Extension Service was bringing that knowledge directly to the people who could use it. A lot of this happens under Goodell's time. He does some curricular renovations. He's the guy who introduced the two-year non-degree course, which became a little bit of a moneymaker for us. Agriculture, all agriculture, that's what he had in mind. He also had in mind that we could become something more than just an agricultural college. He had the idea that to do agriculture properly, you needed to know something about the humanities and the arts. He thought that uh, agricultural people sure needed to know their chemistry, they sure needed to know their agriculture and their botany, their horticulture, but they would also need to know how to read and write. Uh, and it's surprising to me, again, when you look down at what Mass Aggie grads did during Goodell's years here, Certainly a number of them went off and became farmers, but many others went off and became managers and employers. They went off into different directions. Lots of different uh, areas of endeavor that you wouldn't necessarily associate with graduates of, a ma of, of an agricultural college. I haven't put together statistics for it, but a lot of this is due to Goodell. Goodell is also the guy who introduced the graduate school, who introduced um, 
what do they call them, electives as majors. Goodell loosened up a great deal. He opened the door in many ways to curricular innovation that really got the students here excited. So much so that in the 1890s, there's a running debate in the student newspapers of whether we should already change the college name. We don't want to be Mass Agricultural College. We want to become Massachusetts State College. That didn't happen until 1931. But in the 1890s, they're already debating it. Uh, the old farts, uh, the people who were just a little bit older, like Levi Stockbridge, who'd been here from the very beginning, objected to that. He said, we can't turn our back on agriculture, not now. It took him 40 years to, to stab agriculture in the back. But, but Goodell let the students argue this and let students take this up and, and make something of it. They went so far, the students went so far around uh, 1899, 1900 is to take all the college songs and erase the word Aggie and agriculture from them and replace them with Massachusetts. So the college is a really innovative phase in the 1890s. Now right around 1896, Goodell may or may not have done something. And that's admit the first woman. Now, there was a woman here in a special course in 1875. Caroline can tell you. There was a woman here, Lewis Millicent Thurston, here in 1875. A, a special course meant that you paid money, you came in, you took a limited course, no degree at the end, and you got some education, but that, that was all of it. Florence May Valentine entered in 1892 as a freshman to become a regular undergraduate student here, to go through the course. She didn't last long. She only lasted uh, less than a year. Came here from Lynn, Massachusetts. She found, as uh, she arrived here as the first woman, there were no women's dorms, so she had to board in town. Uh, I think she joined a couple of clubs. She engaged in life, but it was a very limited period of time here. Now, uh, let's go back to that. Uh, this is, um, a statement that came probably from Goodell. There's no reason why the young women of the Commonwealth should not avail themselves of the opportunities offered here. Doors are open, they'll be welcomed both by teacher and student. And that's not entirely true. Uh, male students ridiculed the women. Uh, some males were uh, opposed to women joining. Many others were more open and more positive, but it was not a uniformly warm environment for these early students. So 1890, 1892, the first woman arrives and leaves virtually the same year. 1905, the class of 1905, if you look here, you'll see something that's really quite distinct. And that's these two women sitting here right up front. It's Lily Berth, uh, sorry, uh, Esther Cowles Cushman and Monica Lillian Sanborn, who were two women who arrived together and graduated regularly the class of 1905. And if you look at the commencement that year, it's not just these two undergraduates who graduated, but the first woman to receive her master's received her master's that year. And there were five special course enrollees in that year, all of whom were women. All five that year were women. So there was an influx of women. This is the very end of Goodell's time. And Goodell was very ill off and on for the last 10 years of his life or more. Uh, but this seems to be something that we can attribute to Goodell. We usually think of this, the rise of women at UMass happening a little bit later. But, but this is really under Goodell's time here. Um, they, the, uh, the boys in the class were, were relatively excited by Sanborn and Cushman, who seemed to have had a real puckish sense of humor about them. And you see the little writings that they left behind, and they're, uh, they're, they can take a boy's joke, I guess is what I would say. Uh, and one thing they wrote this class in 1905, we're the envy of the other classes. We have two co-eds. It's not been the custom in the past for those of the female sex to stay at this college for any length of time meaning one woman. Uh, but boys, let's act in a gentleman way towards these, our classmates, that they shall be good to stay and graduate with the class of 05, and they sure enough did. Um, there was a woman who came here, didn't graduate in class of 1903, Lily Bertha Allen, who uh, left after one term, uh, but leaving a little bit of a, a poem in her wake in the class yearbook, which, uh, which read, I'll sing you a song of college girls I'll tell you where to go. Mount Holyoke to learn to fuss, still true. Smith to spend your dough, still true. Wellesley for your grand old maids, that's where my grandmother went. Um, Simmons for the slow ones, that's where I teach. For wise ones, go to Radcliffe, that's what I avoid. But for your beauties, Massachusetts. I don't quite 
understand that. But uh, Lily Bertha Allen certainly did. When you go right around this period of time, forward a little bit, and you start looking for other types of diversity, international students and so forth, this photograph from right around 1903 or 04 uh, was one that I ran into, and I'd seen it many, many times. Guys playing football right in front of Old Chapel. They were, there was a little football field set up there. They played ball out there for, for quite a while. And it never occurred to me until recently when I was looking at this that we have an African-American player right there. This, when I saw this, set me off saying, we have to figure out who the first African-American student at UMass was, at Mass Aggie was. And it took me a while, but uh, uh, Mass Aggie did not record race of enrollees at the time. There is, as far as I can tell, no statement in the Board of Trustees, no statement in any of the President's papers saying that we will admit African-American students. It seems much more like Goodell's statement, if they apply and they get in, they come. That seems to have been the attitude. They didn't do much to encourage. They didn't do much to discourage. Goodell may have been one of these guys who quietly did encourage. And I can't prove this right now. But you look at Goodell's past. He was born in Turkey, Constantinople, son of a missionary. Why do we have all these Turkish students? Well, many of them come from missionary centers in Turkey where they're exposed to an understanding. The early Chinese students who Goodell actually did recruit came from missionary centers in China. So he had these connections that word is spreading. The Cuban and the Brazilian students I can't explain. I have no idea. But they were coming. Goodell served in the 25th Connecticut, which is a, a white regiment during the war. He served a nine-month term down in Louisiana. But his nine months there were, uh, included uh, uh, two major engagements, the most important of which is the battle, the siege and battle of Port Hudson. And Port Hudson was known as one of the battles in which there were very large numbers of African-American troops. There were two brigades, if I remember correctly, of African-American troops on the Union side besieging Port Hudson, and they played a very important role. So Goodell is there in this siege and under horrific conditions, if you read his letters. And to the left of him and right of him are native guards from Louisiana, the Jean de Couleur, the, the regiments that they raised, the uh, Corps d'Afrique is what they call them, four regiments from Louisiana, and regiments of other troops from other states, African-American soldiers around him. I have no idea what his attitude towards the African-American soldiers serving with him but he certainly saw a large number of them, and he certainly saw a large number of them engaging in combat and dying like his brothers in his regiment did. Goodell doesn't seem to have talked about it at all. But suddenly, in 1897, in the fall of 1897, we see this man right here appearing, George Ruffham Bridgeforth. We know actually a fair amount about Bridgeforth right now. Uh, by, by this point, not, not everything I would like to know, but quite a bit. Bridgeforth is very typical of early mass Aggie students uh, of color. He is a little bit older when he arrives here. In fact, he was born in 1877. He arrived here in 1897, so he was already 20 by the time he arrived here. Uh, but pardon me, 24 by the time he arrived here, if I remember correctly, I'm going to see my notes here. Yes, 24 by the time he arrived here. I knew the number. I didn't remember the year. Um, he was born in Alabama and had actually gone to Talladega College, a historically black college in Alabama, received a degree before he came here. Now, Talladega is important. Why? Well, it means he had an education, a solid, sound, good education in Talladega and decided to come north. But Talladega is interesting because there are two members of the Mass Aggie alumni pool who ended up teaching in historically black colleges. There were a pair of brothers from Rhode Island named the Bishops, Edgar Bishop and William Bishop. William is the older one, class of 1883, if I remember, and Edgar's 1885. Edgar ended up teaching at Talladega College. William taught at Tougaloo. One of them, and I don't remember which right now, ended up at Tuskegee for a little while. And those three names will keep coming back. So it's possible that Bridgeforth, who is this guy born in 1877 in Alabama, raised uh, in Alabama, 
educated in Alabama, decided to come north. The question is why? Now, 1897, it seems very likely that Bridgeforth might have come north because this is the point of time in which the second Morrill Act, which was enacted in 1890, began funneling money to southern states to create separate and, as it turns out, not very equal agricultural colleges, land-grant colleges down there. They didn't give land like they did in the first Morrill Act, but they gave funding provided that the southern states create opportunities for African-American African students either in white universities or in separate universities. So the schools like Florida A&M, uh, Prairie View A&M, all these land, African-American land-grant colleges in the South are products of that second moral act. They're just getting off the ground here. There's a need in the African-American community for education. There's a need for instruction. Someone like Bridgeforth sees an opportunity in Mass Aggie, I think, to come north and get a degree from a white college to back up and lend credence and strength to the college that he, to the degree he'd already gotten at um, Talladega. Now, when he was here, Bridgeforth was a pretty exemplary student in a lot of ways. He won the Flint Oratorical Prize. He was sergeant of arms of his class. He played in football uh, for a couple of years anyway and was actually not too bad. He was a uh, fairly important guy. He was known for oratorical gifts. Uh, it, was a, it was a bit of a tough road for Bridgeforth. 1897 he arrived and that fall he and a Turkish student named um, Tazjian, Dikran Tazjian, applied to the trustees for relief from tuition and were granted relief from tuition in that fall. In 1900, I tried to figure out where did he live when he was on campus, and in 1900, I actually figured out where he was, and he was living not on campus, but off campus on East Pleasant Street. Now, why, was, why was he there? Well, he was living in a house uh, run by a woman named Louise Baker, who held, uh, Louisa Baker, who held uh, three apartments in her house, two of which went to, or three rooms, I should say, two of which went to white students, one of which went to Bridgeforth in 1900, anyway. Now, Baker, I thought, well, who is this woman? Turns out that she's a benefactor of the university here. Her family had sold a bunch of the property that became the central campus of UMass back in the early days of the university, and she retained an interest. But she also developed an interest in helping the poor of New York and, the, as she said, the colored people of the South. And when she died, there was a little obituary in the student newspaper here saying that she had done this Quietly, no one knew in many cases what she was doing with the money, who she was helping. But it said she even went so far as to pay the tuition of students who were in need and provide them with lodging for students who were in need. And George Bridgeforth, I think, was one of those guys who became one of her support, uh, supportees, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, it says here, this is from, from the, uh, from the uh, biography, uh, the obituary rather, that was published. She, says, she delighted in acting a mother's part toward boys who came to college determined to pay their own bills as so far as possible. She opened her house to such and always had one or more occupying rooms under her roof. She gave them employment and looked sharply after the conducts and habits. The number of Aggie boys whom she helped in one way or another uh, is unknown to any except who knew her well. Many of them helped financially to secure their education at MAC. She advanced the money to complete their professional studies in universities, and in some cases welcomed their sons when they too came to their father's college. Now, Bridgeforth's time here, as I say, he was an award-winning student. He did very well in all his classes. He was uh, engaged in College Shakespearean col uh, Society, and so College Shakespeare Club, pardon me, and, and football became a center of his life. And all of those are things that we will see, attributes that you'll see in the, each of the first nine African-American students with only one or two exceptions at Mass Aggie. They are a remarkably uh, distinguished group of people and they're a remarkably talented group of people who did very well here despite being usually only one per class. Bridgeforth arriving in 1897 is followed by these nine students over a period of around 11 or 12 years and then it stops. 
Bridgeforth is typical of what happens when they go out of college as well. I'm getting ahead of a little bit, but in his sophomore year, or junior year, pardon me, he actually injured himself by igniting a stick of dynamite in his face, um, which, you know, who hasn't as an undergrad done that? But Bridgeforth, it cost him five teeth, and it actually uh, took him out of action for about a month or a month and a half that year. But he came back very well, graduated on time. He was uh, picked up, and when he got out of here with these two degrees in hand, he secured a real plum position. He went down to Tuskegee University and became the farm manager under Booker T. Washington. And he was actually quite a famous figure in Tuskegee at that period of time. He was called a big, blustery, energetic man with a flair and a taste for administrative power. I mean, he, he went down to Tuskegee and he decided he was going to take his advanced agricultural knowledge he'd learned up here and turn it to the good of the African American community in Alabama, where he was originally from. Uh, made him some enemies out there, and ultimately he had some falling out uh, after um, Booker T died, especially with some of the people who he rubbed the wrong way because of his taste for administrative power. But he did a pretty remarkable thing. He then went on to an African American college in Kansas and actually became president of that college. He ultimately retired from that position or left that position, went back to Alabama, and lived his last days uh, in a place called Beulah Land, which was sort of a cooperative community of sorts, all African American, in which they purchased land together and sort of sold lots uh, to relatives and friends. And that community remained an all black community up until the 1960s, 1970s, and I don't, I don't know after that point. It may have continued after that point. But it had this distinctive history where that community founded by Bridgeforth uh, survived the Depression comparatively well. People held on to their land. They didn't lose their land or migrate. They stayed on site. And this is George Ruffin Bridgeforth. <coughs> he did write to W.B. Du Bois. I know someone's going to ask. Du Bois brushed him off, didn't really care for him very much. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 1903, <clears throat> there's a class in 1903, just a couple years after. And if you look here, you'll see William W. Peebles sitting here up in the front, an African American student, in the back, William Hood. Two uh, of uh, the other students whom, you know, sound a lot like Bridgeforth in many ways. Now, Peebles, when you look at Peebles, let's go to the next slide, um, you know, he's not a football player. I mean, I, I just, I just got to say, Peebles is not. He's a slight young man, a very erudite, educated young man. Hood, a little bit different. Hood's got, you know, the slick back hair. He's a little bit, a little bit of a different personality than Peebles on the surface. They roomed together for part of their time here. Uh, but they were different. Hood was from Alabama. He was also a graduate of Talladega. Peebles uh, had come from DC, an upper middle class family in Washington, DC. I think he had spent time at Howard, if I remember correctly. Uh, but his, his father was a builder in DC. His mother was a teacher. Uh, Hood, I haven't been able to track down his family for sure. They were both older. They were both. Uh, had degrees before they arrived here. Hood, in the yearbook for 1903, was called the whitest man of his race, which is something I haven't quite figured out. And he was also called one of the most patriotic men in college. So not entirely sure what that is. Now, Hood, like Bridgeforth, and like most of the first nine, this pioneering nine, went on to take his education here at Mass Aggie and turn it into becoming a teacher and an administrator at historically black colleges. He ended up teaching at Sango College in, in Oklahoma, which is for um, uh, Creek and Seminole Indians on the one hand, and also African Americans. Peebles is a little bit different in that he left Mass Aggie, moved to Chicago, got a degree in dentistry, and ended up, uh, after serving in the First World War, becoming a captain in the uh, dental Army Dental Corps. Uh, ended up settling in Omaha and became a, uh, a dentist, lived there for uh, 30 or 40 years, 30-some uh, years after, uh, at the end of the First World War, uh, as a pretty distinguished professional. He's really the only, only one of the first nine who did not go into education for any period of time. Let's go next. We have the Hubert brothers, class of 1904 and class of 1912. The Huberts, I find, really uh, pretty remarkable guys. Zachary Hubert. Um, the guy on the left here, born in 1877, so he's, you know, he's 
quite a bit older when he arrived here. Both Hubert brothers and apparently every other Hubert of their generation, the next generation, the generation following, all went to Atlanta Baptist College, Morehouse College. Same, same thing, one became the other. So these guys had their degrees before they came up here. Like Hood, like uh, Bridgeforth, they were prize winners. Um, Zachary Hubert, uh, I think, uh, no, sorry, um, Benjamin Hubert, the younger. Uh, won the Flint Oratorical Prize, of which at least three of these uh, Pioneer Nine did. He received a gold medal for that prize and a cash gift of $20, which is actually a great deal of money in 1913, 1912, 1913. His speech for which he won that prize was called The Larger, Free uh, the Larger Freedom of the Negro, which he says was a sustained and effective appeal for the betterment of conditions among the Negroes of the South. Now, he was followed in his oration for, for this prize by a Chinese student, one of the first Chinese students to come in there, who argued for uh, that Chinese culture was rising, not static like most white Americans believed at the time. Benjamin Hubert was a pretty remarkable football player. He was said to have been uh, an all-South colored back at Atlanta uh, Baptist College. Uh, I believe Zachary played as well. But virtually all of these guys had this football team as a center for them. Let's go to the next slide. This is class uh, freshman arriving in 1905, and you can see up here William Hunley Craighead sitting up there, who is a very important guy, one of my favorite people. And you'll see a couple of women sitting off in here. This is a very different class, taken, uh, the arriving class. You can see is a little bit larger than some of the other classes that we've had, sitting right, right in front of, um, what's that building next door that they're renovating? Ah, yeah, Old Chapel. I was testing you. Old Chapel. Uh, you passed. Thank you. Craighead came from D.C. and was a very gifted athlete. Uh, he was loved by his classmates, apparently. He was academically distinguished. He was another winner of the Flint Oratorical Prize. We don't know what his topic was. Um, he was six foot tall. 195 pounds at the time, which is a pretty, pretty good sized guy. And he played varsity football from his freshman year all the way up to the end. And what's important about this is that he played at a time when Matthew Bullock, who I thought was in this photo, but I must have put the wrong photo in here because I don't see Matthew Bullock. This is the wrong photo. But Matthew Bullock would be sitting off on the, on the left here. Matthew Bullock was a Dartmouth grad who came here in 1904, 1907, 1908 and coached football. He is the first African-American head football coach at a predominantly white university. That's here at, at Mass Aggie. He was only here three years. He did some pretty good things. But he brought in, um, he must be in the next image, he brought in uh, Craighead, who became captain of the team. Craighead was also vice president of his class. Craighead was uh, an editor and contributed articles to the newspaper. Craighead did just about everything. He seems to have gone off in education, but didn't attain the levels that the Huberts did. The Huberts ended up being very highly placed in African-American colleges. Zachary Hubert, the younger, became president of Jackson College and then also Langston College out in Oklahoma. And Hubert became uh, an educator as well, but, but didn't quite reach the, the levels of a president. Craighead went off and taught, became a county extension agent and an educator in, in Virginia where he apparently had connections. So he was a teacher, an educator, college, and this applies to just about everyone except for Peebles who became a professional. Let's go to the next guy, John Thomas Carruthers, class of 1907, a guy from Tennessee. He'd come here after uh, a degree at Nashville U, therefore he was a little bit older, 22, 23, 24 years old. Uh, it was said in the, newspaper, in the uh, yearbook, he joined the class in 1907 and has never since regretted his choice. He's been a strong man for the class, having filled with dignity the position of sergeant at arms, yet another of these pioneering nine, and having been rope pole captain for two years. As a result, Naughty Seven, the class of 19, 1907, holds two trophies well won. He won second prize in the, Grinnell, uh, in the agricultural contest, Grinnell Agricultural Contest, which was paper for the uh, prize for the best paper in agriculture. He won second prize for that. He went on and taught at Emanuel Training School in um, southern New Jersey. And he graduated in 1907, which is after Goodell's period. This is right when Kenyon Butterfield came in. And I had been thinking maybe that transition of Butterfield 
uh, pardon me, Goodell to Butterfield had changed the atmosphere on campus somehow away from this idea of recruiting or at least accepting African American students. But 1907, he graduates. Butterfield's only been here about a year, and what does Carruthers do when he goes down to New Jersey? He invites Butterfield to come down and give the commencement address at the, at the Bordentown campus there. And he sure enough does that. Finally, I can't, I've got to talk about Ann Arbor. Uh, Ann Arbor. What, what town is this? Amherst, right? <laughs> Testing you again. Uh, there is one student, and only one student that I've been able to find, who doesn't fit the pattern of being a Southern student who had a degree before arriving here. That's the man in the lower left, Charles E. Roberts. That's Matthew Bullock sitting in the back, the, the coach. And Roberts fits the bill for pretty much everything. He, uh, he uh, uh, joined his class, 19, uh, class of 1911. He was here for a couple of years. He was a superior athlete. He uh, ended up not playing three games in, in uh, his second year here because of a knee injury, but he was a uh, strong runner and a strong football player, participated in the life of campus as well. He came from Amherst. His father was a, uh, ma married a French-Canadian woman, I believe probably mixed-race French-Canadian woman from Vermont. And Roberts was actually born there, but came down here. His father was a janitor at one of the local hotels here. And he lived on, uh, I forget the name of the street right now. It's right off of Route 9, just south of the Amherst. Hazel Street. Which one? Hazel Street. Hazel Street, that's it. He lived on Hazel Street. Someone knows. Hazel Street. Uh, and um, that was uh, his story. Now, I had thought he didn't graduate. Where would he go? What would he do? He did actually leave here. And oddly enough, even though he didn't graduate, I saw that he did enter in and become part of uh, the, educational, the education of his fellow African Americans after he graduated here. He became an athletic director at Lincoln University in Philadelphia area. So he follows the pattern in a different way. He later became a machinist in life and moved to Buffalo and sort of lose track of him. But he, he's a little bit of an exception. But you have this picture of these guys. Um, this is my cat. Um, you have the, a picture of these guys, these nine pioneers who very largely are people who are already accomplished in life. They've received degrees in Southern universities with one exception. They're from Southern states with one exception. And there are virtually no other Southern students at the university. I should have said that. They come north to get a second degree, and they use that as a springboard to go into higher education in African-American colleges throughout the country. Three of them at least become college presidents. Eight of the nine end up teaching in some capacity, and in some cases for many years, in African-American HBCUs. These guys are serious contenders for some of the best students of the day at this university. And we've totally forgotten about him because after Roberts, after 1911, after 1912, we enter in a period in which virtually no African American students are seen here for many years. I still can't explain why we see the first students arriving, and I can't see why we see them leaving. There is a little bit of an exchange, I think, that may help understand this. Benjamin Hubert, one of the Hubert brothers, the, uh, the uh, older of the, the, sorry, the younger of the Hubert brothers, wrote to Du Bois at one point, and we have little exchange between Hubert and Du Bois about education. 1942, Du Bois writes back to Hubert, and I think this says a little bit about Hubert's ideas and about what might have happened here. Du Bois writes, far from believing that we should begin at the bottom and work up as educators in African American population, I distinctly believe that we should begin at the top and use the educated power at the top to lift the masses of the bottom. Higher education is not for itself and its own enjoyment, but furnishes the power and the leverage by which the mass of people can obtain not only economic security, but cultural progress. What I'm trying to do then is obtain for the masses, especially in the industrial development, the leadership of college graduates. That was Du Bois. I think most of the graduates here came from the different perspective, and that is more the Booker T. Washington perspective of training manual arts and getting people marketable manual skills. In the 1890s to 1910 or so, this made a lot of sense. It was a time in which those ideas were, were popular. 
across the country, both in white community and African American community, because it was an opportunity as a way out. And this was an opening of doors in the 1890s. That Second Moral Act opened doors in the South to think about education, manual education, if only, if only manual education, for larger numbers of people. And they needed teachers, they needed students. And these students took it upon themselves to improve their education, to get the imprimatur of a white college willing to do this, and took it back to their college. And they did very well for themselves, but they were working in a paradigm that was sort of self-limiting. So I think there's a supply side of this, where there are fewer students who see the need to come north because there are colleges in the South that are accepting African-American students for the first time in larger numbers. And they're seeing maybe opportunities shifting in front of them, away from the type of education that this first group of nine had in mind to something different, something that didn't match up with agricultural education being the ideal for African-American students. There could have been a shift at the university as well. Kenyon Butterfield arrived here in 1905, was here for a decade and a half or so as the president. And he's credited with altering the curriculum and bringing more and more women into the university and providing, building the first women's dorm and providing educational opportunities attuned to a woman's interest uh, within this larger framework of an evolving agricultural college. Butterfield doesn't seem to have taken up the same challenge in looking at African American students, or for that matter, even international students. And so you see those numbers trailing off and disappearing. It's not clear whether it was a conscious decision or an unconscious decision, he simply didn't do it. And his successor certainly didn't do anything either. Butterfield was a great, uh, a great uh, figure here at the university, but it, was, it took someone like Goodell, whom I think was more open to allowing the university to do things than it was someone like, like Butterfield who opened doors for other people but shut them for African American students. And there are a handful who come here and there. The students, by and large, don't seem to have protested one way or the other. You see moments in Mass Aggie history, Mass State history, and UMass history where white students stood up and said, this is wrong. But until the 1960s, things didn't really change. So I cut off the first 50 years. I don't want to talk about anyone who's dead, who's alive. I really don't. So I don't have a real answer for how we ended up where we ended up. But there is this moment of time that I think we can look back today and say there was something happening here. We don't entirely know why or what, but the product is these nine students who are really outstanding representatives of their, of, of their classes and ought to be recognized as such. So if you have questions, I'd be glad to uh, do what I can to answer. Donuts, no cookies, sorry. <laughs> there are cookies. What, what sources do you use mostly to find on this? This is tough. Um, the sources, it's very tough. I've gone through the president's papers for the period of time, the, the student newspapers, the index, uh, which is the uh, college yearbook, uh, any magazine I can get my hand from the period of time, student records to the best I can. To identify these students was very, very difficult. Uh, and because they are not identified by race anywhere that I can locate. Uh, what, what I could do would be to look at the photographs, but photographs basically don't exist for the students between about 1880 something or other, with any significant numbers, between the 1880s and about 1905. So some of it's guesswork, and one of the things I ended up doing was going through the register of students and looking for any student from the South and any student who's not from Massachusetts, for that matter. And uh, after I got through there, I had some names to work with, and one or two students uh, from the South were white, uh, but not too many uh, white Southerners were willing to come north to, to Mass Aggie. And then you go through things like the census and so forth, and it's tough. I did go through the 1900 census pretty extensively, 1910 census as best I could, 1890 is missing. Uh, and looked all in Amherst to see anybody identified as a student in the listings and see what race was identified because that was one place where they are identified. Um, so it's, it's not super easy, I would say that. But How did these students know to come to um, Mass Aggie? Was it 
marketing, higher ed, great fine. I, I think uh, the Talladega connection and probably Tougaloo Tuskegee is the one thing I can point to concretely. Edgar Bishop, having been down at Talladega for a number of years, had connections down there. So in Talladega, we had someone connected. Um, beyond that, it's a little tough to tell. You know, how we got two guys from D.C. or Washington or Virginia to come up here, I don't know. I mean, it, it's not at all clear. Uh, Mass Aggie was a progressive college, but by the 1890s, 1900, it's one of any number. So they could have gone lots and lots of places, but, um, you know, we're talking one or two a class, which is, you know, relatively small, 5% of any of a, of a smaller class and may, maybe, you know, half that of, of a typical class. So there's small numbers arriving here, but Talladega is one point, Tougaloo and, and uh, Tuskegee. That trio seemed to be kind of critical. And I suspect the presidents of the university or the faculty members here may have had connections that are a little harder to, to pinpoint, but it, it's not obvious. It, it does not seem to be marketing of any kind. Uh, I can say that. And there wouldn't have been marketing outside of Massachusetts. So this is actually a really good follow-up question. Do, were you able to find any type of correspondence between like any faculty or administrators who would have done some type of recruiting efforts? I have looked, I have looked, I have looked. I have not found anything. It's really tough. I mean, uh, I had expected at some point to see African-American students from Massachusetts coming here. And I can't say that there aren't any because I can't say. Uh, but having gone through all the yearbooks and you look at all the photographs, it's, it's tough to tell. There was a woman who graduated in 1919 or something like that who we, I, I was trying to identify the first African-American woman graduate and we thought it was her and I looked her up, she's from Springfield and my God, there's an African-American woman in it since it's identified, but it's a different woman with the same name. And it took me a while to un undo that, but she's sort of identified as our first African-American woman graduate, but it's definitely not her. So it's really tough, and it would take, uh, you know, and I'm going to pursue it, but it will take a lot more work to sort of rule out that there are any African-American students from Massachusetts coming here, or Connecticut for that matter. Um, might take a, a stroke of luck, but really what I hope is that I find a letter like that saying, we have a student in my school, would you, would you take him? No, haven't seen anything of that. And going through some of the alumni profiles and things like that, there's n no one jumps out as obvious. I've, I've tried to track these guys, it's, it's just very elusive. And because there's no clear statement saying we're going to open the doors or we're, we're gonna close the doors, either end, you know, I'm left sort of having to look at everyone. <laughs> What about during the 60s? How, how many blacks showed up? Here? They're living, so I don't look at them. But uh, the numbers don't rise until the later 1960s. After 1968, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, there were a small number of faculty here on campus, Bill Bromery being one. Um, uh, oh my gosh, um, public health. What's. Yes. Uh, there were a couple of faculty who got together and tried to put together a program to recruit African-American students in, after 1968. And uh, although it was uh, only partially successful, I would say, uh, you, you probably know as much or more than I, but uh, it, was, it was successful in a way. It, I think it wasn't necessarily successful in the direction that they wanted to go but it did succeed at getting at least a larger number of students here. The formation of the Afro-American Studies Department here, I think, was a, was a key moment. And the people they brought in here, had in here, and brought in here who, who uh, brought that department together were amazing people. Thelwell and, and Esther Terry, Mike Thelwell, Esther Terry, uh, John Bracey, a little bit later, Bill Strickland. Those guys really, really did know how to put together an academic program, and that helps solidify, but the numbers have remained, you know, too small. There was one person in my class, I remember, as black, and he was actually a big man on campus. Yeah. Right? But there's only one, I remember that. Whole well, and, you know, the Taj Mahal, there, you know, there's a handful of, of African-American students here throughout, and 
Uh, I did run into a case, and I wish I'd written this down, in the late 1940s or earliest 1950s, there was a case that I ran into in the newspapers in which students on campus here, mostly white students, had taken it upon themselves to go and try to integrate a restaurant that would not seat African-American students. And so that was done here. There was lobbying on campus in the early 1950s, mid-1950s, uh, against fraternities for excluding mostly Jewish students, although in, African American students did not get mentioned. But Jewish students uh, were mentioned. There are these prescriptions on integrating uni uh, the frats, and that became quite a uh, big issue on campus in the early 50s. But one fraternity, fraternity tended to have Jewish. There was a there was a Jewish fraternity on campus here even into the 1930s, but it was it was the other frats that were a problem. And the argument came down to the students, the, the frats who did not want to integrate, uh, if that's the right word, um, claimed that they were part of a national organization that had a charter on which the terms were set by Southern universities who didn't want Jewish students. So these, these sort of arguments played out here on campus, but the point is there was, there was a moment of interest here. In the 1890s, there's interest on campus here. There's some directly racist things you can see in the student newspaper, no doubt about it, including a very long article in which one student was arguing that uh, uh, you know, African, African students were, uh, uh, pardon me, African um, peoples of African descent were thrown out into the world after slavery and in a semi-barbarous state and so forth. But it was part of an ongoing debate. And that position seems to have been in the minority on campus here in the 1890s. Uh, Booker T. Washington, you may not have known, came to campus in uh, 1901, was it? Uh, and uh, spoke out, not campus, it came to Northampton and spoke there on agricultural pursuits. And uh, there are a couple of these students spoke, I didn't mention, at commencement uh, on topics dealing with race and racial equality. Uh, the oratorical prize that they gave uh, did the same. So there was a discussion here in the 1890s that seems to have evaporated after the First World War, maybe even before the First World War, but certainly after. And it didn't come back except in these brief spurts until the 1960s. And the assassinations of, of King in particular uh, helped spark the sort of next real change here on campus, as far as I can see. But as I say, I try not to think about or write about people who are living, and those people are living. So. Um, you know, my thought is that the uh, emergence of women on campus and the energy put into welcoming them and having them be part of the campus world was a focus for that first, first what well, the 1900s to the 1950s yeah. was huge, bringing them on. I don't know whether the small campus could have handled two big um, pushes at that time. It's, it's an interesting question. Um, and then the other part of it is you keep referring to the index, mm -hmm. and that would be those that graduated. And right. I didn't know whether your primary sources really looked at not only the special courses, but <clears throat> those that enrolled. I, I have gone through the non-graduates and, to the best I can, the special courses. And it's a possibility that there are more students in the special courses because I, I can't see them all. They're not as consistently recorded. But uh, I, have, I, I believe I've gone through all the non-graduates, all the people who matriculated and did not graduate. And so Carruthers, was, not Carruthers, but um, uh, Roberts was one of those guys who came up as a non-graduate. Uh, he was the only one of the nine who didn't graduate. Uh, one of the guys I didn't talk about, Albert Meebane, was a sh short course guy, special course guy who did graduate. He also went on and taught at Historical Black College, and I think Hampton in his case, if I remember correctly. So there's, you know, I've, I've done the best I can with the records we have. Uh, I'm frustrated that I can't find, we don't have a lot of Goodell's writing, unfortunately. We don't have as much as you would like. But I can't find anything in the trustees or anything Goodell or anything in, in the period of time where you can see an affirmative statement about anything of this kind. And it is possible that there are northern students whom I've missed because they're not identified by race. And it's possible that there are non-matriculants or, or non-graduates, pardon me, or short course people who could have leavened it. But they're a different status. So I, rather than looking at every single one of them, I 
probably have, but rather than looking at every single one, I decided to focus on the graduates because they were the easiest and the best documented. But it seemed too that most of the ways that you could identify someone was with a visual profile. Rather than looking, you wouldn't have any information of you know, any biracial or... No, and, and when, I, when you go through, um, I'm looking for anything visually, and of course that's a terrible guide, but uh, anything that seemed possible, I go to the census and try to find the guy and see how he's identified in the census. And I, you know, that's not particularly a good guide either, necessarily. I have a, a friend of mine in Michigan who was doing his family genealogy, and he traced back uh, to his, I want to say his great-grandfather, who had been born into slavery on the North Carolina-Virginia border. In the 1870 census, he's listed as African-American in Virginia. 1880 census, I think he was down in South Carolina, listed as Indian. In 1900, he's listed in Georgia as white. And in 1910, he's in Michigan as African American. So go figure it out. Now you can get an idea of who the guy is by, by phenotype. He can pass for almost anything. And depending on where he is, what his job is, what he's doing, what he wants to try to do in life, he can take a position one over another. You don't want to be African American in Georgia in 1900. And, and you don't want to be uh, native in, in South Carolina in 1880, but he was, uh, because it was probably preferable. But this kind of thing makes it even more difficult to look at the students here. But I, I've got to get something to, to get these students on. And that's why I say Bridgeforth may not even be the first student here. He's simply the first we can identify. And until this, we didn't know, I think we knew only really about one of the other nine students. Not, you know, so I've been able to uncover another seven. Uh, but it is notoriously tough. Even women who are a little easier to identify by name uh, are very tough to identify before a certain date. And the short course may have had more than the one woman that we can identify positively. But what we can say pretty surely is there are few. There are very few. From your research, did you find that any of those nine students corresponded with each other or knew each other from different classes? Excellent question. I mean, I know Hood and Peoples lived together for one year. Uh, they shared a, a room. The students generally, the African American students, generally lived in the same dorms when they lived in dorms as white students. Uh, a couple of them lived in boarding houses, but in boarding houses that had both white and black students. Uh, Hood and Peebles shared a room together. Uh, I recently got interested in whether the Japanese students are here, whether they were integrated as well. And you can convince yourself of almost anything, but I, I can find a couple of instances where you have, say, two Japanese students on campus at the same time sharing a room. And we don't know how that is, but you see also instances where they're out and most of the students had their own rooms, so they're integrated by room, if you want to call it that here. That's the most I can say. After leaving here, um, I can see letters of these guys, you know, obviously the Huberts knew one another and they stayed together, and as educators at that level, there's every reason to expect that they could have corresponded, but I don't, I haven't been able to track that down because we wouldn't have that documentation here. Uh, the best they've been able to try to do is see who writes to Du Bois, and three or four of these guys do, in fact, correspond with Du Bois. So, because Du Bois corresponds with everybody. <laughs> Didn't know if you knew that, but. <laughs> Except that one woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. No, du Bois doesn't correspond literally with anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, it's a vitally important question, actually, to ask whether these students who are coming here are assisting one another when they leave here. And my guess is that these guys, it's usually one student per class. In 1903, there's two, but it's usually one student per class. And so their cohort is basically all white around them. They would have known the other students a year before, a year after, but not necessarily as well as the students in their class. It's a little harder to tell as a result whether to make anything of whether they supported one another after leaving here. I, I was just floored by how well they all did. You know, how they all landed immediately in these positions teaching and how they 
did quite well. Bridge Forth rising through the ranks and the Huberts who were uh, an incredible fa family as far as I can tell. Everybody in that family is incredible. Uh, but several of these other guys rising up to the tops of the ranks as quickly as possible. And you see also the hardships they faced. You know, getting, uh, getting fired from a position because you have a segregationist governor who comes in who decides they got the, you know, these kind of things happen to students here, but I see the, one of the pieces that's missing is did they help one another? Can't tell. I, I got to believe the answer is probably, but I can't tell. Anything else? Yeah. Um, so uh, it sounds like most of, most of the, the black students came here, they already had undergraduate degrees. Yep. And they, came, and they got a second undergrad, or yep. were they getting, a, a, they have masters? Yeah, second a Bachelor of Science they would have gotten here, yeah. And uh, they, I, I did some work to try to track down the first graduate degree, and it might have been in the 30s, is my recollection, after the period of time that I was, I was working just the first 50 years. Uh, but there seems to have been, there's a um, master's in, I want to say it's agricultural chemistry or something like that in the, in the early 30s uh, from an African-American student here. But uh, these students are coming here and they, they mostly have gotten educations and I believe in most cases gotten degrees before coming here. That's not all that necessarily unusual. Uh, you know, for people intending on a career in academia at this time, uh, getting a degree here and then going and doing additional study abroad if you were in the sciences, you know, going to Göttingen or Tübingen or the Freiburg School of Mines or something like that to, to, to raise yourself up is something you would do either with or in lieu of a graduate degree. Um, so this is a version of it, and I, th I think it's a fairly ephemeral version of it because the educational landscape changes, but in this moment of time, it happens here, so. Well, thank you, I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Enjoy the, uh, the union stuff. <laughs>